Well, good morning, and thank you, Lord, for the rain, right? We need the rain. Um, could it come at a better time? But we'll take it. We'll ta we're not going to complain about God's timing here. Um, we are just thankful that each of you came this morning. I know the temptation was to pull the covers up over your head, um, but we are just so grateful that y'all made the effort to come and that you prioritize the study of God's Word in your life. So thank you so much. Um, our children have a fantastic story today. They are continuing to learn about Moses, and today it's Moses in the burning bush. And so it is so funny. I was back there, and they were doing a little craft, and I said, what, is, what are you making? It's a tree that got burnt up. <laughs> and I said, yes. And then we decided that the children probably don't know anything but burnt up trees because that's all we, everything in their backyard is burnt up these days. So, um, so we are so grateful for Barbara Whiteley's group. They, we need every hand we can get back there with over 100 kids in our program this year. We need your help each week. So thank you. It's one day a year that you have the opportunity and the privilege to serve and give back to this ministry. So thank you, thank you. When it's your turn to serve, we can't do it without you. So um, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, I just thank you so much that you have brought us all here this morning to open your word and have it transform our lives. Father, I pray that we will be women who discern your will for our lives and intentionally stay in your will under your umbrella of protection. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to just jump right in today. Um, I've got a lot to say, a little bit of time uh, to say it, and so we're just going to jump in. So buckle up. No funny story to start us out. Well, we're just going to Go right at it. So first thing we need to understand about our text today is where we left off last week at the end of chapter 7 and when we, where we started this week, the beginning of chapter 8, between those two chapters is about 20 to 25 years. Okay, so there's been a, it's not like, okay, next week, the, last week, this is what happened. So 20 to 25 years between chapters 7 and 8. Okay, so it's quite a bit of time has passed. And what we're going to see going forward is really a transitional period for the nation of Israel. They are moving from an era of the time of judges, where the judges govern them, into a time of the kings, where the kings govern and rule over them, okay? Now, the judges, we've talked about this for weeks, the judges did more than just simply adjudicate cases, like, like we know what judges do. The judges were really the leaders, the political leaders, if you would, um, of the country. And they led them politically, spiritually, in battle many times. And so that's what the judges did. So as we open chapter 8, we see that Samuel, who is a judge, he's old, right? He's gotten old. It's been 20, 25 years, right? Um, he is still leading Israel. And we see that he has appointed two of his sons to be judges also. And they are governing down in the southern part of the country. But what we read about those sons, it wasn't good. They were taking bribes and they were perverting justice. And it sounds a lot like our judicial system today. So anyway, scripture says that all of the leaders of Israel came to Samuel. And they say, okay, Samuel, this judge system, it's not working for us anymore. And we really kind of want a more centralized government, if you would. We want a different kind of government. And they list out a number of reasons why change is necessary. First thing, you're old, Samuel. <laughs> Ouch, right? Second thing, your sons are corrupt. So, ouch, right? And then we see down in later, in, in, chap, in verse 20, the real reason why they want to make a change. And the real reason is because we want to be like all the other nations. We want a king just like everybody else around us. We want a king that will judge us. We want a king that will lead us. We want a king that will guide us into uh, battles and give us victory. We want, we want, we want. Scripture says that their request was the word that the scripture used was displeasing to Samuel. I thought that was an interesting word. It displeased him. 
my opinion, if, if it were me, I would not only be displeased, I would be discouraged. Because I don't know how you can help but feel like this is a personal affront. They're saying, yeah, we don't want your leadership anymore. Uh-uh, we don't want to do it that way. And I would, I don't know if he did, but I would have taken that very personally, right? Um, Samuel knows that what they're asking for is wrong, and it's going to lead them down a very difficult path. And so his heart is breaking for what his people want. It's very, very sad if you, if you think about where they are as a nation. Because the Israelites, they were God's covenant people, right? He was their king. He was their Lord. He was guiding them, right? They were intentionally unlike all the other people around them. It wasn't a fluke. They, God's not holding out on them. Intentionally, God had set them apart. They were sanctified, set apart for God's purposes. This was an intentional thing. God dwelt with them. He had given them his law that was supposed to guide them in wisdom and truth. Samuel had spent his entire life driving the people and pushing them toward the Lord, toward their king. But that wasn't good enough for them. They wanted a change. They wanted something different. So I think reeling from this personal sting of rejection, I know if it were me, I'd just be like, fine, go, then go do what you want. But what, is, what does Samuel do? He goes to the Lord in prayer. Ah, this is what we should all do, right? He goes to the Lord in prayer. Let's see what God says. Verse 7, chapter 8. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people. In what they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And for me, that passage gave me a lot of comfort. Because I don't know about you, but there are many times when I try and share the gospel with someone. And they give me the stop sign. Or if I have KSBJ playing in my radio, on my radio in my car and non-believers get in they say what is that can you change the channel or you invite someone to church and they say no nah, I just really don't do church that's, that's not for me and they dismiss us as Bible thumping Jesus freaks right You're, they, they reject and we feel that it we take it personally right they're rejecting us but here God says they're not rejecting you when they reject coming to church or Christian music or the gospel they're rejecting me which is very sad right so don't get upset when they do that. Pray for them. Pray for them. That's the lesson we can learn there. So the elders have come to Samuel and they say, you, we want you to give us a human king. We need a human king. Now the desire for a human king in itself was not wrong. Because as you read, as you did in your study, you saw that God had made provision that eventually there would come a human king that would culminate ultimately in the King Jesus, right? Um, but the problem is here with the, the Israelites is they wanted a king for the wrong reasons. And they want a king now. They don't want to wait on God's timing. Very important. They don't want to wait on God's timing. And this brings us to the, I think the whole crux of today's passage, really the crux of life in general for, for all of us. The people wanted their will to be done their way rather than God's will to be done in their lives. They wanted their will to be done in their lives, not God's will to be done in their lives. You see, it was God's will that he would be their king. This was God's will from back at the beginning, that he would be their king. They didn't need an earthly king. He would be the one that protects them. He would be the one that provides for them. And most importantly, he would be the one that loves them so much. But God is not going to force his children to reciprocate that love. He's not going to force them to do that. He's not going to force them to rely on him for anything. He has given us all free will. And we are free to make whatever choices we want, even if those choices do not align with his will. The Lord is going to allow Israel to get what they want. And ladies, I'm, I'm going to tell you, when we choose to step outside of God's will, 
it is a very, very dangerous place for us to operate. He'll let us do it, but it's a dangerous place for us to operate. I have an illustration, and thank goodness it was raining today because I hadn't used my umbrella in like four months. So I had my umbrella handy, but um, standing under an umbrella is a picture of standing under God's will, standing in God's will. I am standing here, everything is, I'm, I'm protected, but does it mean that when I'm standing in God's will that everything in my life is going to be perfect? Absolutely not, because I live in a fallen, sinful world, and I am a sinner. But when we stand in his will, when those difficulties, when those challenges come, we can face them with peace and confidence, knowing that, okay, I'm standing with God and he's got me in this. He's going to carry me through this. He desires that each of us stay close to the, his will, under the umbrella, under his protection. But he's not going to put a handcuff on me and chain me to, to walk alongside him. He is not going to force me to stand under his will and receive his protection and to receive his love. If I choose to step out from under his will and do life on my own terms and live however I want, it does not mean, this is what I want us to all hear, it doesn't mean that God stops loving me. He still loves me, even though I'm making bad choices. He's not rejecting me. He, he's not kicking me out of the kingdom. That's not what it, it is at all. But when I step outside of his will, what it means is, number one, I, I will not receive the blessings that he has planned for me. And number two, I will certainly receive the discipline and the consequences for stepping outside of his will. Okay? So you may be asking, well, Leslie, how do I know what his will for my life is? Write down this verse, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, and we test it through prayer, through scripture, uh, by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. That's how you determine what the will of God is for your life. We pray, we consult the scriptures, and we allow the Lord to, to give us discernment in determining that, okay? So God is allowing his children, Israel, to step outside of the umbrella. He's going to let them do what they're going to do, right? They so desperately want a king. This is not God's will, but they want it, and so he's going to let them do it. Does it mean that God is pleased and with their choice? Nope. Doesn't mean he's pleased with it, but he's going to let them do it. And he instructs Samuel, hey, before I do this, I want you to warn them what they're getting into. And the, the word there in the original language, warn, means to give them full knowledge of their actions. You spell it out for them, that this is what's going to happen if this is the choice that they make. And he, he basically is saying, I have given, given, given to my people. A human king is going to take, take. And you read in your scriptures, he's going to take your sons, he's going to take your daughters, he's going to make them work for his purposes. He's going to take the best of all of your crops. He's going to take your money because he's going to increase your taxes exorbitantly. And he's going to take the people and conscript some of them into forced labor. So basically he's saying, you're going to go back into slavery. Verse 19, nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel and they said, no, no, no. We'll take the king. We'll, we'll, we'll take the human king. Give us him. Sometimes people just have to learn the hard way, right? If you have children, you know this, right? If you have teenagers, you are living this, <laughs> right? Because somehow when kids get to be teenagers, many of them think that your rules are stupid and they shouldn't apply to them and they don't have to follow them. And many teenagers at that point in their life will rebel against their parents. What we're looking at here is Israel behaving like a rebellious child, right? I read this week that the greatest judgment God can give us is to let us have our own way. Yikes, right? To let us live outside of the umbrella. 
the greatest judgment God could give us is to let us have our own way. God says, okay, my children, you want to rebel? You want to live outside the protection of the umbrella? Okay, but don't say I didn't warn you because I'm warning you. This isn't going to be good. This is not what you need to be doing. And ladies, here's what I think all of us really need to understand. God can and will use our poor choices when we step outside of the umbrella. He'll use those to correct us if necessary. But it is so much easier if we just don't step outside of his will, right? If we could just make sure that we are staying in his will, prayed up every day, surrendered to him every day. Israel found that living under his umbrella, having to trust in an invisible God, one they couldn't see, one they couldn't talk to, and having to obey those commandments, that was just too challenging for them. And so in spite of all the Lord had done for Israel, they turned their back on Almighty God and chose to have an infallible, imperfect, flawed man for their king. This is where we open chapter 9 and we're introduced to Saul, that infallible, flawed, imperfect man. Now, Scripture tells us he's from the tribe of Benjamin. If you know your Old Testament, you go all the way back to Genesis. Uh, Jacob had 12 sons, right? Um, every one of those 12 sons became the head of a tribe. There were 12 tribes of Israel. Benjamin was the youngest son of the 12, and so he was the head of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, over the years, as many years unfolded, the tribe of Benjamin arguably, arguably became the weakest and the most disrespected of the 12 tribes. But nonetheless, this is where Saul is from, the tribe of Benjamin. Saul was exactly the type of person that the people would have chosen for themselves. He was a man's man. He was wealthy. He was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. He was good looking and he was probably very charismatic. He was the people's man and God was going to give the people exactly what they wanted. Now we know that he would not have been the number one choice for God because God has already told us in the scriptures the king that I will give you in coming from the tribe of Benjamin he's coming from the tribe of Judah and we can see that we can follow that lineage all the way to Christ okay so you read the story how um, Saul and his helper they're going out searching for the donkey this was just how God orchestrated a meeting between Saul and Samuel okay so they're looking for the donkey can't find the donkey three days go past let's go home let's give it up and the helper says hey there's a man of God in this town and maybe he can help us let's very interesting I, I hope y'all discuss this in your group so here's Gilbeah this is where well right here it, Gilbea is where um, Saul is from and Ramah, right here, is where Samuel is from, five miles apart. How is it that Saul has no idea who Samuel is? They live five miles apart. This is the most influential spiritual leader in the entire country. And Samuel goes on these jaunts where he goes doing judgeships all around the country. How does Saul not know who he is? I mean, that's a mystery to me. Um, but I think more importantly what we need to see from this is it tells us everything we need to know about Saul's spiritual life or lack thereof there is no spiritual life he does he, does, he has no idea who the spiritual leader of the country is so like many people today perhaps so I, I you know I don't think he was like evil I don't think he was at this point he wasn't a devil worshiper right he wasn't anti-religion he just had no interest in following God you know, like many people today, he was secular-minded of the world rather than spiritual-minded. So Samuel and Saul meet in town. You read the details of that. Now, this wasn't a chance meeting. It wasn't dumb luck. It wasn't a coincidence. This was the providential hand of God moving in this situation. God arranged it because he had chosen Saul. God chose Saul now let me just bring this a little closer to home for all of us it wasn't by chance that you heard the gospel message it wasn't an accident that a family member or a friend shared with you 
the truth of God's forgiveness and his love. And it wasn't dumb luck that you came to a saving knowledge of who Christ was. God arranged that because he chose you. If you leave here with nothing else today, God chose you to be his child. So God has chosen Samuel for his purposes um, in the Old Testament. But the the day before they meet, God had come to Samuel and said, verse verse 16, there we go. Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over the people of Israel. And you read how they met, they went and enjoyed a meal together, and and Samuel kind of hints that something big is coming. Saul's very confused. What are you talking about? He says, "Ah, we'll talk about it tomorrow. So tomorrow, let's go to verse 10, chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you shall save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. Now, put yourself in Saul's sandals. Um, Out of left field, all of a sudden you're told you're going to be the king, right? So I'm going to be the king. This guy came to me and told me I'm going to be the king. So I think this series, we, you read a long passage about the series of three different sequences. They're going to have three loaves of bread in his left hand. He's going to be walking. There's going to, and a very detailed sequence of events. This was in order to serve as proof, confirmation, that on your way home, Samuel says, all of these things are going to happen, and this is going to confirm in your mind, okay, this was really the Lord that told me this. This wasn't just a fluke guy that came up to me and said, you're going to be a king. This is from God. And in your study, you read about the details of all of those events and how specific they were. I, I read this week that um, Dr. Hugh Ross, who is a Christian um, astrophysicist, very well known, he said that the probability of each of those events happening in that specific order that Samuel said would be one in eight million. So I, it's just only a sovereign God could orchestrate that with such perfect timing and such incredible accuracy. So as Saul tur- or turns to, from this meeting, you're going to be king, and he's heading home, we see scripture says God gave Saul another heart. Now, I just want to touch on this for a second because I, I don't think that we can impose on this our new, understand, our new Testament understanding of a new heart because I don't think that's what this is talking about from everything I read, that this is not life transformation. Probably what this is is a, a temporary change in attitude is what, is what it probably refers to. He came in as a farmer. And he's going home as a leader, okay? So this isn't um, a salvation change of heart, okay? Later in the text, we see that the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul. And so a very important fact that we need to understand, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, did not indwell people permanently. God would bring the Holy Spirit and anoint people with the Holy Spirit so that they that would allow them to, to serve a purpose a task for his kingdom, and then the Spirit would leave them, okay? It was not permanent. It was a temporary thing in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we know that at Pentecost, the Spirit came. And for all of us who are believers, that Holy Spirit does not come and go. You don't have to say, oh, come Holy Spirit. He's there. He's already in you. He never leaves. He doesn't go anywhere. He is always in you, permanently residing in you. He never leaves. Okay, so the Spirit has come on Saul. The time has come to publicly introduce Saul to the nation. And so um, Samuel's called everybody together. And before he introduces Saul, he's going to preach a little sermon here. And he's going to say, this is what I, I want you to know what you're getting into. So let's look at these verses, 18 and 19. He, Samuel, said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought you out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you, you have rejected your God, who saves you from all of your calamities and your distresses, and you have said to him, set a king over us. So remember at this point, it's only the Lord and Samuel and Saul that know 
that Saul is the guy, right? And so in order for Samuel to show the people, the Israelites, this is God's choice, not my choice, this is God's choice, they decide to cast lots. Casting lots is not throwing dice out in Vegas. Casting lots was a very biblical, God-ordained thing. And after they finish casting lots, it's determined that, yeah, Saul is the man. So they start looking around. Where's Saul? Where's Saul? Where is he? And this scene, this reminded me, remember the scene in Sound of Music where they, the Von Trapp family singers go to the festival and they go to introduce them, they, the family Von Trapp, nothing. The Von Trapp family singers, nothing. Oh, yeah, where are the singers, right? Where, so everybody's looking around saying, where is Saul? God says, hey, Samuel, he's over there hiding in the baggage. Did y'all wonder the baggage? Probably because all the people came to Mizpah for this meeting. It's a long journey. They probably brought suitcases with them to suitcases, bags with them. Okay. So, but he's over there hiding. They're not an auspicious start to a king, kingdom, right? Um, so he finds himself very awkward situation. You can see him, uh, you know, hey, Saul, stand up. And he's real tall, you know, so he's rising up above the baggage, you know. And, sees, you know, and Saul says, that's your guy. That's him. And everybody, yay, yay, Saul. Okay. So. Not long after that, Saul faces his first test. The people of Jabesh Gilead, we have a map here. I need to talk fast. Um, Jabesh Gilead is over here on the other. Here's the Jordan River, other side of the Jordan River. Still Israel. These are Israelites. But here's Amnon. Over here is where the Ammonites live. Moab would have been down here where Ruth was from, okay? And this is, again, where uh, Saul and, and Samuel live. So, um, so it's a crazy story, but the people of Jabesh Gilead, they're invaded, um, and the bad guys say, we're going to kill you, and they say, well, no, let's make a treaty, and we'll be your servants, okay? We'll serve you. And they said, and the bad guys say, mm, okay, well, how about this? You serve us, and we're going to gouge out every one of your right eyes. What? What was that? And they say, mm, let us think about it for a week, and we'll get back to you. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> anyway, so I thought, started thinking, what is, gouge out your right eye, why, what, what is this, this is a military strategic thing, most people are right eye dominant, and so if you're holding up your shield, or if you're trying to shoot an arrow, you, you basically are helpless, so this would render the men of Jabesh Gilead, I, I mean, they totally defenseless to defend themselves, so Saul hears about the, what's going on, and the Spirit of the Lord again rushes on him for the second time, right? And Saul formulates a battle plan, and it works beautifully. Now, it was successful only because the Lord rushed upon him. The Lord was with him. He was standing under the umbrella of God's will as he went into battle. Tune in next week. He doesn't stay under the umbrella very long. How about you? Are you under the umbrella of God and his will? Or have you chosen to step outside of his will? Have you conformed to the world? Are you living life on your own terms? He wants you back under that umbrella. He doesn't need you back under there. He wants you back under there because he loves you so much. Will you choose to snuggle up close and walk in obedience with his will for your life? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for the lessons we have learned today about staying under the umbrella of your will. Father, let us be women who discern your will for our lives and then walk in it in obedience. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.